After a conversation about Italian food, Shinichi and Mayumi decided to change their travel plans last minute and make their way to Rome. Meanwhile, the plane they had disembarked from was nearing the end of its journey. The plane made radio contact at 5.01am and the pilot confirmed, quote, We expect to arrive in Bangkok on time. Time and location, normal. This was the last known location of the aircraft before it disappeared over the Andaman Sea just after 5.10am. This is Red Rum, a podcast focusing on the true victims of crime. Eight thirty a.m. on the twelfth of November, nineteen eighty-seven, was a cold morning in Pyongyang. Mayumi Hatche was preparing for a flight to Moscow with her father Shinichi Hatche. The pair boarded the flight. And as the plane began its ascent, Mayumi settled into her seat and drifted off to sleep. The plane made the uninterrupted straightforward journey to its planned destination of Moscow, arriving at 6pm. Shinichi and Mayumi alighted the plane and spent the next six hours waiting in Moscow airport for their flight to Budapest. The pair arrived early the following morning and immediately made their way to their next destination. The Japanese tourists were heading on a holiday of sorts. They spent the next six days with a friend in Budapest before being driven 150 miles to Vienna. Shinichi and Mayumi then checked into room 603 of Ampark Ring Hotel. They went to sleep early and the very next morning headed to the Austrian Airlines office to purchase the rest of their travel tickets. They bought tickets travelling from Vienna to Belgrade, to Baghdad, to Abu Dhabi, and to finish in Bahrain. The following day, however, they also bought tickets flying from Abu Dhabi to Rome via Amman. On the 23rd of November, Shinichi and Mayumi boarded their Austrian airline flight from Vienna to Belgrade, where they checked into yet another hotel room. They had been in Belgrade for four days when they heard a knock on the hotel door late one evening. A good friend from Vienna had taken the train to Belgrade to meet them. The friend stayed for a few hours before giving them a gift. A Japanese-made Panasonic radio which Mayumi spent the evening fascinated with. The next evening, Shinichi and Mayumi made their way to the airport and boarded an Iraqi Airlines aeroplane. The pair were searched at security and the batteries Mayumi was carrying in her bag posed a problem, so she threw them away. After that, and without any more issues, they waited in the departure lounge for just over three hours, passing the time by playing with their new Panasonic radio, which Mayumi set the time on to nine hours and zero minutes. The airline staff then announced Korean Air Flight 858 was ready for boarding at 11.30pm, which Shinichi and Mayumi boarded in seat 7B and 7C. Mayumi placed her gifted Panasonic radio in the overhead compartment and settled into her seat. As she looked around, she noticed the majority of passengers to be men, South Korean construction workers who were on the heading home trip from the Middle East. Most of the men on board had gone months and some years without seeing their families, and this was their long-awaited journey home. The flight landed in Abu Dhabi three hours later for a layover, where, after a conversation about Italian food, Shinichi and Mayumi decided to change their travel plans last minute and make their way to Rome. However, the pair ran into difficulties when having their visas checked in Abu Dhabi, so headed to Bahrain instead, with the intention of making it to Rome eventually. Meanwhile, 
the plane they had disembarked from, the plane heading towards Thailand before its planned final destination of Seoul, was nearing the end of its next journey. The plane made radio contact at 5.01 a.m. UTC, and the pilot confirmed, quote, We expect to arrive in Bangkok on time, time and location normal. The plane's signal was picked up by the Ragoon control tower as it passed near the coast south of Ragoon at 5.05 a.m. This was the last known location of Korean Air Flight 858 before it disappeared over the Andaman Sea. Family and friends of the 115 passengers and crew waited anxiously to hear news of the mysterious disappearance of the flight, whilst the authorities immediately began to search for the plane near Burma, Thailand and India. Witnesses had heard an explosion early on Sunday morning and villagers saw the plane fall. Thailand then launched a major search backed by the military in a wooded area of Kanchiabori province. All 115 passengers and crew perished in the explosion. The Korean authorities suspected sabotage and quickly started checking details of the passengers on board, in particular those who had disembarked in Abu Dhabi. They realised that two Japanese passengers had taken Korean 858 and through a stroke of extraordinary luck changed their plans last minute to take them to Rome. Mayumi and Shinichi arrived in Bahrain without any difficulty and made their way to their hotel for a couple of days until their scheduled flight. They checked out early and arrived at the airport to catch their final flight to Rome. Just as they were about to board, Mayumi noticed a number of staff members whispering to one another and then a slight commotion at the boarding desk. Two officers from the Bahrainian authorities appeared and asked Mayumi and Shinichi why they were travelling with only carry-on luggage, as well as why their travel plans had changed so much. The pair were unable to answer in satisfactory detail and were apprehended for questioning. They were placed under arrest for the suspected act of terrorism on the South Korean flight 858. Suspicions were cast on Mayumi and Shinichi for a number of reasons. Firstly, they had only written their given names on their entry forms, contrary to Japanese tourists usually writing only their family names. They also flew on Korean Air Flight 858 from Baghdad to Abu Dhabi, even though they then went on to Bahrain. This involved an extra three-hour airport wait and Bahrain could be directly flown to from their initial destination. It made no sense to take the flights they'd chosen. Whilst Mayumi and Shinichi were being held, authorities checked the legitimacy of their passports with the Japanese embassy. Japanese experts examined the passports and reported back that they were indeed fake and were very skillfully made most certainly the work of an organised forgery group. Mayumi and Shinichi were held at the airport as they awaited questioning. Whilst waiting together, Shinichi asked if he could smoke a cigarette. As he took one out of his packet, he turned to Mayumi and offered her one and said, quote, What awaits us is interrogation and eventually death. I am an old man and have lived a long time, but you are so young, I am so sorry. Hidden inside the cigarette was a small capsule filled with cyanide. Sinichi bit down onto his, ingested the cyanide and went into convulsion. But as Mayumi went to swallow hers, an investigator noticed the commotion and quickly hit Mayumi's arm, forcing her to fall forward and most of the cyanide wasn't swallowed. Mayumi did, however, fall unconscious 
whilst Shinichi died immediately. The authorities' suspicions that the pair were secret North Korean agents began with the attempted suicide by cyanide ingestion, as this was identical to the known method of suicide used by other North Korean agents who had been captured in the past. Mayumi was discharged from hospital and extradited to South Korea on the 15th of December. She spent the next few days in bed due to exhaustion after the effects of the poison, and once she was well enough to start talking, the South Korean authorities began to question her. She admitted that the passports and her identity as Mayumi were false. She told them that she was actually an orphan from northern China and that her name was Pai Choihoi. She said she met the other man she was travelling with by chance and that he really was an older Japanese man. However, the authorities were sure she was lying when they realised that the only form of Chinese she could speak was the southern Chinese dialect of Cantonese. She wouldn't respond to any questions when asked in Korean and continued to write poems in Chinese. However, at 5pm on the 23rd of December, eight days after her arrest, Mayumi revealed that her real name was Kim Hyung Wee and she was in fact a secret agent from North Korea intelligence. She said that at first she was firmly determined to keep quiet and expected to die because of her silence. She felt she needed to protect the reputation of her beloved leader. However, over the previous eight days, the officers that were in charge of the investigation had begun to build up a rapport with Kim. They took her on car rides through the city showing her what South Korean life was really like. Kim watched TV shows and news reports showing the affluent lifestyles of South Koreans, a complete opposition to what she'd been told by the North Korean leaders. She also saw the freedom that people had to speak dissent and even criticise their government. She saw families having fun, hundreds of cars, crowded clothes shops and the Olympic Village. In North Korea, she'd been told that South Korea was corruption-filled, poverty-ridden and a slave society. Kim also commented on the South Koreans' kind treatment of her and that she gradually came to see the light. She realised she'd been deceived. It was at this point that Kim knew she'd been betrayed and this led to her changing her mind from staying silent and loyal to her leader. She said, quote, At first I couldn't muster the courage to appear before the public because I committed such a crime and because of my thoughts about those who died in the incident and their families and the people of the South who were greatly shocked. So I refused to have a press conference and pleaded, let me die quickly. I also watched educational television programmes proudly showing the long national history. The national identity is stronger here than in the North. The South is developing our national heritage. Having noted the real differences between the real South and what I was told and made to think in the North, I could not help but change my mind. I deserve to die a hundred times for my crime, but I felt that I should disclose the truth of the incident to atone for the deaths and to repent for the families in my own small way. So I agreed to the press conference. I hope there will not be any more such senseless incidents that victimise many innocent people. At the United Nations Security Council meeting, North Korea denied responsibility for the attack and stressed that they had no connection to either of the terrorists. North and South Korea, divided since 1945, were bitter enemies and had often clashed since the end of the Korean War in 1953. The South Korea representatives learned through Kim's testimony 
that the attack was an attempt to disrupt the forthcoming Olympic Games in Seoul. North Korea suggested that South Korea had bombed themselves in order to set up North Korea. South Korea's representative said, quote, All the evidence, photographs taken in Vienna and Belgrade, false passports, airline tickets, code books, the poison capsules, the wreckage of the airliner, the dead body of the man later found to be Kim Sun Il, all of it supports and substantiates the freely given confession of Kim Hyung Wee, the North Korean female agent. We have heard some weird stories from the North Korean delegation this morning. For us, they represent nothing but clumsy fictions and fantasies, which appear so bizarre that I could not help feeling that sometimes they were funny, sometimes they were pitiful. The authorities also needed to know exactly how Kim came to be the most deadly female assassin in modern history. Kim told authorities that she had grown up with her mother and father in North Korea. Kim was a keen student and excelled in her schoolwork, as well as after school activities. When she was just 10 years old, she attended the North-South Talks in Pyongyang with a close school friend where she was chosen to present flowers to the senior South Korean delegate. She stressed that the upbringing of a child in North Korea is robotic. She said they are brainwashed to believe that South Korea is the enemy and to worship, without question, their leader, Kim Il Sung Gi, who is their god and who you put before your own parents. She said that from early childhood, you're taught to say, quote, thank you, great leader, for everything. If you ever said the wrong thing, you'd end up in the gulag. A gulag is a type of labour camp or prison. A lot of refugees that have escaped North Korea refer to them as concentration camps. Kim went on to say that there is no sense of freedom of choice and that North Korea is not a state, it is a cult. Kim was considered to be a North Korean brainchild and attended Pyongyang Foreign Language College to study Japanese. However, during her second year of studying, she was called into the dean's office. A central party member was there to tell Kim that she had been chosen. She was allowed one last night with her family. The next morning, a black sedan turned up outside her house. She wasn't allowed to say goodbye to her friends. She just had to pack and leave her old life behind, entirely. Kim was given a new name and spent the next seven years living in a compound in the remote mountains of Pyongyang. Whilst there, she learnt spycraft including physical fitness, three years of Japanese, martial arts, code cracking and infiltration. She spent a number of years training under teacher Yeiko Taguchi, Yeiko is a Japanese citizen who was kidnapped by the North Korean intelligence agency when she was just 22 years old. In June of 1978, she was working at a bar in Tokyo to support her two young children. One morning, after dropping them both at daycare, she was kidnapped. Over 20 years later, North Korea admitted to the kidnapping and declared she had died in 1986. However, Kim testified that Yeiko was alive and training her for the 1987 bombing. In addition to this, the Japanese government, as well as both of her children, now 42 and 45, believe that she is still alive. During Kim's training, she learned how to kill using just her hands and just her feet. She learned how to use grenades and assault rifles. By the time Kim's training was coming to an end, she took part in a series of rigorous training regimes. One of her retainer tests required Kim to infiltrate and memorize a fake embassy document. Whilst there, Kim was also taught Cantonese, as well as being shown how to do many tasks that didn't exist in North Korea, such as the use of credit cards, shopping in supermarkets, and visiting discos, 
By the time Kim reached 25 in 1987, she was given the details of a huge operation. It was a mission devised by Kim Jong-il, the future leader of North Korea. The handwritten note from Kim Jong-il himself was handed to her in secret. She was told that if she was successful, she would be able to return and live with her family and wouldn't have to work as an agent afterwards. All of her training had been leading to this. She was trained to get it done and in no position to argue if it was right or wrong, the thought wouldn't have even crossed her mind. She was teamed up with an older spy, Kim Sun Il. He was legendary for his work up to this point. The pair were told they would be posing as Japanese tourists. As part of their travelling backstory, the two agents became familiar with the European ways of life. They practiced general European tasks and became confident with how the airports worked. Kim had been taken to a guest house in Pyongyang in August to have her photo taken and signed for the fake passport. The events from there on unfolded much the same as I told earlier, with a few major differences. The two agents arrived at the airport in Pyongyang at 8.30am on the 12th of November 1987. They travelled to Moscow and then on to Budapest. However, once they were there, they didn't stay with a friend but actually stayed with a North Korean guidance officer for six days. The guidance officer then drove Kim Sun Il and Kim Hyung Hui to Vienna, where they purchased two sets of plane tickets, including the Abu Dhabi to Rome flights, which was their planned escape route. The next discrepancy in their travel details was the evening of the 27th of November, when their friend visited from Budapest. This friend was actually another North Korean guidance officer who had traveled by train to give them a time bomb, disguised as a Japanese made Panasonic radio, along with a liquid explosive in a liquor bottle. The pair traveled to Baghdad where the only issue they ran into when being searched was some batteries Kim had on her. However, in reality, when they were searched, they actually had in their possession the radio that contained 350 grams of Cosmopolitan C4 and liquid explosive disguised in a whiskey bottle, both of which were never found and they continued on with their journey as planned. Once they arrived in Abu Dhabi, the agents disembarked and watched their plane fly off, knowing its tragic, destined fate. Immediately after Kim had planted the bomb, she began her escape. The problem for her was that she ran into some visa problems in Abu Dhabi and the alternative escape route plane didn't leave for another two days. At this point, the agents had no idea if they'd actually been successful in blowing up Flight 858, but the very next day, Officers came looking for the pair at their hotel room. This is also the moment they found out that there were no survivors and that their mission was complete. The news conference following the agent's arrest was conducted by the officials of the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, who said that the two were equipped with highly sophisticated explosives and sabotage gear, and that the bombing was an elaborate operation aimed to cause terror and disrupt the Seoul Olympics. They added that the Olympics would go ahead and would be a genuine festival of peace and harmony for mankind. In March 1989, Kim was sentenced to death for her part in the bombing and mass murder of 115 people. The ruling was upheld by the Supreme Court. However, the Justice Ministry recommended a presidential pardon on the grounds that Kim confessed. And on the 12th of April 1990, South Korean President Roe Woo granted a special pardon, 
saying that Kim was brainwashed by the North Korean government, who are the real culprit. The president referred to Kim as a, quote, child who is as much a victim of the evil empire as the passengers on board. Ro Tawu's pardon is questionable, as his presidency resulted in his acknowledgement and guilt of gaining 24 billion won, which is equivalent to nearly 16 million pounds. Ro was also given a 17-year prison sentence for treason, mutiny and corruption for his role in the 1980 Guangzhou massacre, which saw the deaths of over 2,000 people. That being said, the government's status on the decision to let Kim live was given, quote, as a witness to North Korean atrocities. And it is important to take Kim's upbringing and environment into account, specifically with regards to a brainwashed state an escaped North Korean citizen, Jiang Gwemjai, said, quote, I believed in this system for more than 20 years, but I was so thirsty to find out about the outside world. Then when I realized it was all lies, it was like I was just born at 23 years old. 23 years had been stolen from my life. It's reported that North Korean homes, offices and classrooms were made to hang portraits of Kim Il-sung-gi and Kim Jong-il. The citizens are made to wear pins of the leaders close to their hearts. The TVs and radios only play state-run channels. If you are ever caught with an unfixed or foreign device, you will be punished severely, usually by being sent to a labour camp. There is also no internet at all unless you are one of the elites. These teachings of loyalty and supreme leadership start young. When preschool teachers give the children milk, they say, thank the dear leader. Because of his love and consideration, we are drinking milk today. Whilst in high school, you must complete an 81 hour course on the history of Kim Jong-un, as well as a 160 hour course on Kim Il-sung-gi and 148 hours about Kim Jong-il. After Kim's pardon from her death sentence, she was released and has since been living in a government house under protection and round-the-clock surveillance of guards. She now lives in hiding in a safe house in South Korea with her husband and two children, constantly fearing Kim Jong-un will murder her. Over the years, she has been told that her family were in a concentration camp in North Korea because of her disloyalty. When talking about her mission as a secret agent, she said, quote, I thought about all the people that would lose their lives in a few moments, but I was convinced I was acting for the best to reunify our two countries. When a commanding officer ordered a soldier to put a bomb somewhere, we didn't think about the difficulties. The soldier had received a mission to put a bomb in a certain place and it had to be done. That's how we were trained. At the time, they said to me that what I was doing was helping to provoke a revolution in South Korea, which would lead to the unification of our two countries. I was ready to fight and die to achieve this goal. Kim also says that she remembers when a North Korean agent was in Europe. He seduced a French citizen to come on a trip with him. Once they both arrived in North Korea, the agent disappeared and a number of political officers arrived. They took the French citizen to the toilets and she was beaten and then disappeared. It's well known that North Korean intelligent agents kidnap Japanese nationals. And this brings into question the disappearance of any North Korean visitor. Brainwashing can happen anywhere, but does rely on some pretty specific factors in order to make the brainwashed person do things that a free-thinking human is unlikely to do. As it is an invasive form of influence, it relies on complete isolation and thus dependency of the person being brainwashed. It's a form of control over a number of physiological needs if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's this. 
so the brainwasher may control food, water, shelter, clothing, air, and reproduction. This, along with threats, isolation, and indoctrination, works to break down all sense of identity and replaces it with a chosen set of behaviours, attitudes, and beliefs, such as the hate and terror of South Korea. It's impossible to know if Kim was brainwashed, but what's clear is the evidence of coercive influence Although brainwashing as a defence began with some strong conviction rates specifically in the US, it quickly fizzled out due to its simplicity as a theory. Within recent years, defence has moved more towards coercive influence, which is a concept that more closely resembles laws around undue influence. Even so, it's almost certain that were Kim hyong wees case one of US jurisdiction, her crimes wouldn't have gained a pardon It's worth noting that when American soldiers were captured during the Korean War, as many as 30 soldiers refused to come back to their home country once they were set free and pledged allegiance to communism evident in North Korea. This is a clear example of brainwashing in action from the nominally communist country. The only specific information I could find on the victims was that one was a South Korean diplomat and that he and his wife died in the explosion. This is especially distressing, given that the victims were mainly construction workers, travelling four and a half thousand miles, and sometimes spending years away from their homes for a better paid work life, in order to provide for their families. Korean Air Flight 858 was the coming home trip for many of those workers, and their wives and children waited excitedly for them to show up in just a number of hours, only to find out that they'd never see them again. 